three to three and a half minutes, and then I'm going to give you the 200 word description and introduction to our speaker for tonight. So, time to get the rest. Um, I do want to mention to you that our next meeting is January the 13th, second Tuesday, and it is titled The History of the Pittsburgh Fire Department. Mm -hmm. This is a meeting that had been scheduled earlier last year, but our speaker, Kip Dileonibus, he was ill, he's back on track, and he's up here, happy he'll be up here, happy to talk about the history of the Pittsburgh Fire Department. Um, those little things they roll down the streets and, and pump the water out of it today. Uh, in February, we have a meeting that I'm going to pass out the information on. Um, we're going to try and do a little attempt at oral history, where our topic is, I went to school in Squirrel Hill. Um, we're going to do a few minutes, a few minutes, we'll spend a few minutes on Squirrel Hill's older schools and perhaps have a few old photos. But I really invite all of you to come bring anything you have from your high school years, bring your high school letter on your sweater, bring your high school sweetheart, I know some of you will. Um, and we will just get down to business and have a little time, with just a little bit of structure, talking about what it was like to go to school in Squirrel Hill in whatever decade you went to school. So that will be our attempt at what we should If you have any experience, please call me. I'd love to hear from you. Um, in March, um, our speaker will be Quentin Spraven, who will talk about George Weston. In April, and any of you who know Jim Wright, Jim Wright was a squirrel merchant, and in the in the 60s and 70s, he was the president of the Squirrel Hill Merchants Association. When it was, I have to say, it was in its heyday in the 50s, but it had a, quite a revival under his period in the 19, early 19, late, late 1960s, 1970s. And we'll be there in April. We'll get to know even more about your neighborhood, even if you can get here all your life. And in May, our speaker will be Dr. Elizabeth York from... Love it, please. Okay, our speaker will be Dr. Elizabeth York from Chatham University. And she will talk about the history of Pittsburgh in prints and photography. That is one of her specialties. She's been our speaker several times over the past few years. You will find that she has a wonderful print collection that she shares with us. Um, I also have a bit of information about something you can do during the holidays, and that's our member uh, back there, the Westinghouse Castle in Wilmerding. It will be open from today, so January the 10th. It has wonderful Christmas decorations, a lovely train display, and invite you to come back and see the, Wilmerday, see the Westinghouse Castle in Wilmerday. Um, it does have an admission fee, $5 to learn a little bit more about history that's always been around you. It's not a bad price to pay. Any other things you want to say about this? Um, you can tour the building. I, I volunteer in the train room, Lionel Gage, uh, an O Gage train, beautiful train display. But um, the building itself is definitely worth seeing. And although the Heinz History Center wants you to think that they took all of George Westinghouse's stuff, first of all, they didn't take the building. And second, <laughs> uh, the people at the Westinghouse Castle put a new museum in. So um, it's definitely worth going. So this flyer's in the back. And they look like that. Right? Yes. Good. Now, our introduction to tonight's topic and tonight's speaker. I'll give you the quickie descriptions of the Rivers of Steel. It's a homestead based organization and it wants to preserve the region's industrial heritage. It wants to celebrate the legacy of the homestead steel strike and its meaning. And it wants to celebrate the history of the real people who grew this region. The Rivers of Steel is their museum, is in Homestead. And if you go to the waterfront shops, we're all standing on a place where steel was made for a hundred years. But not all of its history has been paved over. The original pump house of the Homestead Works is still there. The Rivers of Steel is a terrific regional museum and a terrific asset. 
as each year goes on, people begin to show more and more appreciation for the actual industrial heritage that we have around the world. I hope you like tell you a lot about this. Um, I hope you also mention the current exhibit that is at the Rivers of Steel. And that is called Seeing History. Uh, history is not necessarily a book's uh, history. The Seeing Pittsburgh is uh, a series of photos, art, and audio recordings of 11 different local neighborhoods. And actually, just go and want to do something like that. We'll give you a better appreciation of your neighbors and of the neighborhoods around you. This exhibit goes on until January the 31st. So rain or snow, winter or summer, you have an opportunity still to get there. And now, the 200, 100 words about Ron. Um, Ron is, for ex excellence, our historian of the steel industry. He is local. He grew up in Squirrel Hill and in Mount Lebanon. Um, he also has family roots that go way back into Pittsburgh's history. Um, one member of his family, uh, Isaac von Gelderland, 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 operated a pawn shop in, in downtown Pittsburgh on Smithfield Street. Another one, Wolf Barrel, is that right? Um, he was one of the founders of Rudolph Shalom, which if you read our Squirrel Hill Historical Society book on Squirrel Hill, Rudolph Shalom was originally <coughs> located in downtown Pittsburgh before it moved out to the suburb of Oakland. So he really does have roots. Um, Juan is also degreed in public history. He worked at the Oregon Historical Society. Uh, he was sought out for his position that he has at, with the Rivers of Steel, and he returned to Pittsburgh and his roots. Um, in his role as the director as the director of museum collections and archives, Ron, among other things, lots of things, collects objects for these archives. And, and what really impressed me about Ron's background is that many of these objects are not high polluting and fancy. They are from the real people who actually made the steel, or who are the children of the people who made the steel. And Ron collects these with a real respect and awareness. Uh, I hope you'll join me in welcoming you all. This is my new PR person. <laughs> <laughs> that was great. Where'd you get all that? Uh, somebody's Google. been snooping. Google. So, so, somebody's using the internet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, as you said, my name's Ron Barrow. Um, I am a native squirrel builder, so this this is uh, this is pretty cool. It's pretty cool. There's a, there's a couple of people here that have known me for a long time. <laughs> Well, since before I was born, right? So, there you go. so they, they've got all the good dirt on me and my family, so I have to behave. Anyway, I am Director of Museums and Archives for the Rivers of Steel National Heritage Area. I've been there since 1998. Um, I returned to Pittsburgh right around that time, actually, and was sucked into this. I thought I would be here two, maybe three years, and then you know, go on my merry way. Um, I've come to realize something that maybe I knew all along about Pittsburgh, that uh, you can leave it, but it never leaves you. you, know, you can leave this region, but you're always of this region, and it, it's tough to do the, I'm just gonna come back for a little while, okay? Uh, I think I'm here for a good long time. What I'm gonna do is just kind of pop through some of the things that we do at Rivers of Steel. Um, please let's, let this be very informal. I'm probably the least formal person you're gonna meet, so if you have any questions or anything in the middle, feel free, raise your hand, Whatever, okay? I'd rather have a discussion than just listen to myself talk for the next however long, okay? And also, let's hope that our AV works okay. really well. <laughs> okay, can you guys see that okay? Yeah. There it is. Yeah. Yeah. How's that? Better? Yeah. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. um, as you know, we are sitting smack dab in you know, the middle of what was this, the steel making capital of the world for well over a hundred years, and that's what Rivers of Steel's mission really is dedicated to, is telling that story. But it's not just telling the story of industry and the captains of industry, but it's telling the story of the people, and all the, you know, 
all those pull factors that brought us all here and all the communities that we built and all, all the bits and pieces. It isn't just steel, it, it's, it's foundries, it's glass, it's the Ma and Pa shop on, uh, you know, on Forbes Street or whatever it may be. I mean, my family's here not because they worked in the mill, because my family's here because there was that need for merchants. You know, my family didn't work in the mill, probably many folks here, their families didn't work in the steel mills. But it's still that main pool factor. And that's that central hub in the story of the Rivers of Steel. Alright, so what, how many of you folks have heard of the Rivers of Steel? Wow, that's really good. That's, that's really good. I'm very impressed. Um, a lot of times I'll ask that question and I just kind of get this look like, uh, you know, um, in trying to explain what a heritage area is, isn't always easy. It, because heritage area, I mean, you're seeing the, um, the geography of it. And we are now actually eight counties, Butler can be colored in. That's an older slide. I have to uh, update it. Butler is, as of, I believe, about two weeks ago, officially became part of the heritage area. But what does that mean? So we're looking at all of southwestern Pennsylvania, eight counties at this point. So you've got the, the geographic part of it. But really what, what a heritage area is, is a common story, a common thread. Okay? Most of our funding comes from the National Park Service. We get some state funding. We rely more and more on uh, private funding at this point. Um, but we are an affiliate of the National Park Service. <coughs> what does that mean? You know, what? You know, why do they do this? Heritage areas are a relatively new notion. And it's a way of preserving a region and bringing funding into a region and promoting a region, all based around a central theme. Um, you know, there are heritage areas based around the American Revolution. There are some based around the Civil War. Um, there's heritage corridors that are based upon a, um, a natural resource or a um, you know, natural formation. In our case, the story is steel and industry. With Pittsburgh being the epicenter, but all the rest of this being interconnected. What was happening in this region is all based upon that larger story of industry and why people came here. Created in uh, 1996. Um, boy, we're, we're more than 3,000 square miles now. I don't know about Butler adds, but uh, still nice. It, 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 it was a long process to add Butler County. We're happy to have them. Um, we actually, to, to add a county, this is an interesting little thing, to add a county, we have to go in and do a number of different studies and show that it fits thematically into the story. So, in this case, um, a number of commissioners from Butler County came to us and said, we'd like to be part of this. And what do they get from being part of it, you know, other than saying we're part of a heritage area? What they get is that the ability to then connect into our network and our funding sources and the ability to then move together with other entities throughout the heritage area to promote ourselves. Really, the major idea is promoting the heritage so that people will come here and come here and spend money. So what did Butler bring to the group? What they bring to the, actually Butler's really diverse. And I, I, to be perfectly honest with you, when it first came up, I thought, mm, this isn't going to work. <laughs> okay, Because Butler's industrial center is teeny. I mean, it really wasn't a huge section. But there's enough, because a lot of Butler, as you know, is, a, is farming. But, Exactly. There you go. So you've got Armco, you've got Roebling, you know, in Saxonburg. They made the first army place up there. Yep. So there, it's there. Exactly. So it is there. It's just it, most folks when they when they think Butler, they think more of the rural. Okay. But you get around Butler City and Saxonburg and some of those those other. Yeah. I mean, you've got a centering plant. Well, had a centering plant. It is there. The roots are there. The railroad roots are there. If any of you folks are rail fans, I'm sure there's someone here. Yeah, there you go. I, yeah, they're, they're always it. Okay? And I mean that in a good way. Um, <laughs> um, but that's that's where it is. So the, it, it is connected. And that we spent a good 
<laughs> bit of time over the last few years showing that connectivity. Doesn't U.S. Steel have its record store in the mine up there? Mm -hmm. Yep. It, it's actually in one of their old mine stuff. Yeah, it's, it's. So it's there. It's mm -hmm. absolutely there. So then that question comes up, okay, well, now you've got Butler, what about Mercer? You know, what about Lawrence? And, and it's go that's going to happen. I think in time, you know, it's going to grow some more. But then you start to get in a little more with with Mercer, and you're looking at is it in the sphere of Pittsburgh or the sphere of Youngstown? Are you limited to Pennsylvania? We are limited to Pennsylvania, yes, absolutely. Um, but not in our discussions. And as we move forward, I'll probably mention the Pittsburgh Industrial District, and that actually extends beyond Pennsylvania. Where is all right, so again, I guess I have to change my slide now since it's eight counties. Um, and within these counties, there's a number of institutions and sites that all relate back to this history and the history of the people. And the idea is for us to tell these stories and preserve these stories and help the people within these communities preserve the stories. And, I mean, it isn't our goal <laughs> to say, well, we're the Rivers of Seal, we're going to come in and do your job. No, what, we're, what we are doing is assisting these folks in telling their story. By no means do we usurp them in any way. Okay? Um, just, you know, out of curiosity, have any of you folks ever been to W.A. Young's and Sons Machine Shop in Greene County? <coughs> Incredible place. Um, this is a case of us coming in and actually taking over a facility, which doesn't normally happen. It is in Greene County, uh, real close to the West Virginia line, right on the line, it is absolutely gorgeous there. This machine shop opened in 1907, closed its doors in 73, I believe, might be off by a year. It never changed. It stayed in the same family. It was steam driven. The only, the only major adaption they made was going from steam to electric. But it's belt driven machinery. It's a full machine shop, a full foundry full pattern shop. Everything is still there, just like the guys walked out the door yesterday. Absolutely the most incredible industrial foundry site in situ anywhere in this country. Uh, a lot of my summer is going to be spent their inventory in this place and putting together a, uh, a proposal to have it be um, set aside as a national historic landmark. We received a, a Save America's Treasures grant for the site. Um, we're going to be signing the, the actual official transfer probably you know, in the next few weeks um, to bring it in and to really open it up for tourism. It's an amazing, amazing place. You know, they, all, the, all the manuals are still sitting where they always sat. They're every little tool. It's amazing. Do you mean they never modernized it like in the 1930s? <coughs> no, by modernizing, they, they went from a, a steam engine running. Mm -hmm the uh, machinery to electricity, but not electricity as in each machine is plugged in. It's still all driven by belt, belt it's belt driven machinery. I actually should have brought some interior pictures. It's these huge overhead belts. The Amish yeah. still do that. What's that? The yeah. Amish still exactly. do that. Exactly. But this is a really amazing um, in situ piece. I've been into other machine shops that we've, we've gone in and inventory. Nothing compares to this. It, it, it's it's phenomenal. Which and town is it in? It, it's in uh, Rice's Landing. <laughs> yeah, you've heard of that. Man. <laughs> Rice's Landing is teeny. Actually, Rice's Landing, um, in its early part of the history, and that's where this machine shop grew out of. In its early part of its history, um, had locks, and so they had a you know a, a uh, lock master. There's a couple of lock master houses that are still there. And this machine shop sprang up to serve the packet boats. In the steamship. Is that open at the time? Um, only by appointment. The Green County Historical Society has owned it since the mid 70s. And this is by no means an indictment of the Green County Historical Society, but they're very limited budget, very limited staff, that they've never really been able to figure out what do you do with this and how do you do this. So it's open you know, kind of by appointment. They do a couple times a year the uh, Pennsylvania Blacksmiths Association which is an incredible group of any of you who are familiar with, do what are called hammer-ins, where it's like blacksmiths from not just all over this region, but from all over the country come. 
and use this facility. Um, it's incredible. It's absolutely incredible. It's a, it's a really neat place. And, and so what's going to happen over the course of the next couple years, I'm going to go in, I'm gonna, we have to do a, a full inventory of the site, but then we're going to start getting it ready for tourism. Mm -hmm. and so that people can come down there, whether it's on a tour bus, or even better, by the river. Absolutely amazing daytime excursion. It, it, the approach from the river is phenomenal. Um, just so you know, um, the images on the bottom, have any of you ever been to uh, St. Nicholas in Millville? Okay, Axel Vanka. Okay. Um, another incredible site, and that was the, the furnaces on the left of the former Buchanan Works, which doesn't look like that anymore. Okay. So what do we do? Here we go. I've kind of let some of the cat out of that. We, we do a lot of uh, educational and interpretive programs. Uh, we, for schools and communities, individuals, we assist other entities, historical societies, um, historic homes, etc., in helping to develop their interpretive patterns in ways to, to, to better their product and to get more people interested in, you know, through their doors. One of the ways uh, that we do things are um, interpretive signs and panels. Now the ones I'm going to show are just, you know, I'm, I'm being a little homestead-centric with some of this. Um, it is my backyard. But we, we've done this throughout the uh, heritage area and have programs to do more. But what I'm going to show now are some of the sites we did in what, are, in what is now the waterfront. So you've got this development that used to be this huge steel mill. Before that, it was home to 60% of the population of Homestead. And now it's retail. And you have people that are going over there that have no clue where they are. You know, other than a few things sticking up here and there, you know, they don't know what they are. So it's incumbent upon our organization and others to tell this story. So people know where they are, so they have a sense of place and they realize how important it is. So we did a series of panels throughout the waterfront. This is just kind of showing where some are. This is one of them that talks about the social life. Um, and it's the social life in Homestead, but especially in what was known as the ward, which was the lower part of Homestead, which in 1941 was completely raised to make way for the expansion of the mill for World War II. So what you see now when you go into Homestead, up, all the houses up on the hillside, that actually was only about 40% of the population. Most of the folks lived in what is now the waterfront. So this was an opportunity to tell that story so that people know and they understand where they are and who they are. Did they acquire all that property by eminent domain back in mm -hmm. 1940, 41? 41, yeah. Actually, what happened was they've been looking at it for a while. You know, you know 1939, World War II starts. And, you know, it was obvious that at some point we're going to be involved. But what we were doing was supplying the Allies with steel for their ships. The homestead is vitally important for this. Our plate coming out of homestead you know, is really going all over the world. Um, in 1940, there's actually, I just had a researcher in yesterday asking about photos of Franklin Roosevelt coming to homestead in 1940. The reason they wanted these photos was because they're doing a paper on what the real purpose of this visit was. It, it was an election year, yes. But really what they were doing was Roosevelt and his group was taking a look at Homestead and seeing if the mill was the mill they wanted to put major money into. They did this throughout the Pittsburgh district, but Homestead was the, the biggest expansion. So in January of 1941, you know, you're talking like two other months before Pearl Harbor, January of 41, um, the DPC, which is the Defense Plant Corporation, and on the federal government, um, got the entire, entire, and a lot of it's taken by the government, put $75 million into it. It's a lot of money. It's a huge amount of money in 1941 dollars. It's a lot of money now, especially that. And essentially told all these folks, and you're looking at 8,000 people, you know, that this is it. You got it. And you don't have a whole lot of time. 
maybe a couple weeks to get out. In a lot of cases, it was knock on the door, you know, pay, give them their check, the next day the house is gone. Um, now, you know, see, I, you know, it sounds a lot worse than it was in a lot of cases. For a lot of these folks, this was moving on up, okay? They're, they were getting out of, in some cases, tenements and squalor and moving into a modern home, the ability to move into a modern home. Um, Glen Hazel, which I don't know if you're familiar with that, it, it's off of Browns Hill Road in Eugene, back in there. Uh, Glen Hazel and the Homestead Mud Halls, or the Mud Hall Homestead, sorry, excuse me, uh, were two complexes that were built for the folks that were moving out of the water, you know, but in the water. Um, these folks had modern kitchens, modern bathrooms, some cases, ooh, they had hot water, <laughs> you know. So it wasn't all bad. It wasn't all bad. Um, but most every one of those folks still, you know, anyone that I've ever talked to is still really kind of romantic because they lost their neighborhood. What well, seemed like a good deal at a time, and that, that really harkens back to what we're trying to do. What seemed like a great deal at the time, and that you're moving up and you're you're, you're bettering your your life. What you what you lost in return, though, was that sense of community. And it's something that a lot of them miss to this day. Anyway, along with all this, um, I'm going to talk about some of the other products that we've done. This is Shape by Steel. It's a um, CD compilation. Uh, you had mentioned earlier about Doris Dyan. This is one of Doris's big products. Um, and what, what the purpose of this is, is to show the, the music and the stories of the region. And it's, it's very diverse. It isn't just steel worker stories and songs about steel mills, but it's also the newer immigrants. Because we can't forget that this, this region is still evolving, it's still changing, there's still immigration. There are stories to tell. Um, but yeah, but, but this, is, uh, this is the first test to sure everyone's lying out there. Uh, this is actually a gentleman named Roy Smith, who worked at JL for a number of years. The conception of mill workers were that they were big, dumb mill men that walked into a mill and took their heads off and put them in their locker, put a hard hat on and went to work. And that wasn't so. I mean, people were bursting with pride. And I'm one of them. I, uh, I burst with pride for what I did in that mill and what I, my job was. And I remember men that I, men that you would see that just look like everyday men, if, if you could just imagine the responsibility that they carry, because a lot of people don't realize in a plant there was no, nobody ever turned the lights on or off. They were on all the time. In fact, uh, the gate was never shut. The place was never dark. It was continuous movement throughout the plant from one end to the other, every operation, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, every day of the year. It never stopped. Everything was constant. When you went home at 4 o'clock on a day you worked in the mill from 8 to 4, when you went home at 4, somebody picked up the tool you were working with and used it till midnight, someone else picked up that tool and worked it till daylight the next day. So when you went home, it would be like going to work on, on a Monday and coming back the next day and it would have been Thursday because three other days had taken place on your work job. And the thing about it is, nothing is, works forever. And so there was all these things that were there to work. Now you're at home and you get a little problem with a sink or a faucet. You say, oh boy, we're going to fix a faucet. It's a calamity. We had 36-inch pipelines that we had plumbers taken care of, you know, that, that were in freezing weather. If you can imagine what... Okay. Anyway, you get the idea. It goes off the rails. Actually, Roy's a wonderful, wonderful guy. Uh, I met him right after I started this job. And a uh, bit of a neophyte on, on the steel industry. I mean, I, I knew some just from growing up here. We probably all know more than the average person just because we grew up with this in, in our backyard. But Roy kind of took me under his wing. He, he was the last man out at JL Pittsburgh. And he took me under his wing, and um, we spent many, many, many hours together. And he would tell me how things work and why it matters. And that was actually one of the many oral history interviews we've done with him. I know you had mentioned about doing oral history earlier. That's a huge component of what we do. It's the capturing of these stories from the people that live them. Um, and Roy was great. You ask him one question, you know, 45 minutes later, you know, <laughs> <laughs> like, oh my God, not okay. Um, but wonderful guy, still in this region, uh, was one of our tour guides for a number of years. Which is a good segue here. Uh, we also do the Babushkas and Hard Hats tour. Have any of you ever been on that? It used to be the Big Steel Tour, once upon a time. Um, 
It's the reason I got the job, actually. That was my first job was to write this tour. Um, it's, a, it's a nice tour, it really is. And it takes you from Station Square and Mount Washington and kind of walks you through the Mon Valley to, to ride you through, you're really on a bus, through the Mon Valley into Homestead, where you, you, you learn the story of why here? Why did it happen here? Why, why Pittsburgh? Why not uh, you know, the steel industry at Omaha? You know, it's that convergence of all the factors that you need. It's a nice tour. Um, regularly sells out very quickly. Um, so if that's something you're interested in, let us know. And we also do um, a traveling trunk. And we, we have a few other programs along this line. The traveling trunk is one that, that kids just eat up because they get to try on all the program. And you know, adults eat it up too. They, they don't like to try these things on. And a couple others that uh, mentioned some Milltown, and that's we do that in partnership with the Frick. So the groups go to the Frick and see how the, the industrialists live. And then they come to the pump house, which is one of our facilities, which I'll get into in a few minutes. Is that part of the The pump house? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, we are that building. Um, and, and when they come to the pump house, they learn about what, what life was like for the rest of the people, you know, what it was really like. And to go along with that, it, it is life on a dollar sixty-five. And this is mostly for school kids, and it's uh, one of the better field trips we do. Kids come and they learn what it was like to try to survive on making a buck sixty-five a day. And so it's not just you know, industrial work, but it's also the, the domestic side. And so we work these kids hard. By, by the end of the uh, field trip, they're tired. <laughs> they're hauling bricks and washing babies and cutting cabbage. They're all sad. Okay, so now I saw this floating around earlier. Roots to Roots. It's a driving guide done, which I guess uh, we're, we're actually updating it pretty soon. Uh, and we're going to have to include Butler now, aren't we? Uh, but the idea behind Roots to Roots is to um, get people out into the community and out into all these wonderful little towns and, uh, and cities that, that populate the heritage area. It's one thing to talk about it, but it really means so much more to get people out there and get them to see it. And get to see you know, the little bakeries that have been there for 110 years and still doing things the same way or, you know, uh, Whatever it may be. I mean, it's, it's pretty amazing. Um, and I, I know there's a copy here somewhere, so take a look. It, it's, it, it's a fun book, but it, the, the problem with a book like this is that you have to constantly update it. Things change, hours change. You know, a lot of these facilities have a hard time making it. Okay, so now we're in historic preservation, another aspect of what we do. I spent a lot of time doing this. Um, our biggest project with historic preservation, if you've ever been to the Bose Building, you know, was our headquarters. Uh, the Bose Building is significant because it served as the meeting place for, <coughs> excuse me, for the advisory committee of the Amalgamated Association of Iron and Steel Workers during the 1892 Homestead Lockout and Strike. Why that building? Well, quite simply, it was the tallest building on 8th Avenue that was close to the mill so that you could see what was going on. Uh, folks know the story of 1892? Because, mm -hmm. no. I mean, I, I can get into it a little bit, but there's that great, that great problem of we'll be here for about 10 hours. Right. Mm -hmm. um, very simply, it, it's um, the watershed event in labor history. And there's, there's a bit more about it later on. And, and it was a turning point in this country of how things were going to go between labor and management. Okay. The reason it happened at Homestead is Homestead had, first of all, it was the last of Carnegie's mills, and your Carnegie's mills that had a union in it. He had busted the union everywhere else. But, even more so, Homestead was a workers' republic. It was a workers' town. It was run by the workers. Um, it was built by the workers. It was not a company town. You know, there's, there's that, a lot of people have this perception that Homestead was a company town. It was not. It was the exact opposite. Okay. And the leaders of the town were the leaders of the union. <coughs> okay. And they felt that 
they should have a say in how things work in the mill. Okay. That their their labor and their skill help build that Carnegie <coughs> Empire and help build that mill. <coughs> kept that mill running. And that the, the money from the capitalists was a great thing and that they had a big part in it. But without the workers' knowledge, what do they have? Okay. So, long story short, <laughs> contracts are coming up. Carnegie and Henry Clay Frick have decided that no more union. We're done. This is the last for mills like that, we're not going to have it. And there's a number of reasons for that, not the least of which is their money, their investment, their decision. That's how they see it. Um, there are a few kind of, uh, attempts at negotiating, but they're not real attempts because the goal is to bust this union. The union knows this. They pulled together an advisory committee. There were actually eight different lodges throughout Homestead. So each, each mill had their own lodge. Mm -hmm. Okay? So, you know, the one, you know, the 119 had a lodge, and, you know, the 110 had a lodge. They each had their own lodge. Okay? So they pulled together the leaders of all these lodges and, and said, you know, we've got to be prepared. We're going to be locked out. There's going to be a <coughs> right? Now, the, the thing to keep in mind with this is that of the 3,800 workers in Homestead at the time, only about 600, I've seen various numbers, but only about 600 were actually in the union. It was a union for skilled workers only. It's not a union in the sense of a 20th century union. Some I'm saying 21st century, 20th century. Some of them were members of the Knights of Labor yeah. separately. And that yeah. was, I, I think it was more if you kind of think. Yeah, but it's the, but the unskilled laborers were still not welcome in any of this. They were in Homestead. Uh, no, they were. I'm reading a book about that. Yeah, right no, they they were not. They were brought on board at the very end because they needed their numbers and for protection. Um, but regardless, um, it was it was a union of the skilled workers primarily. Mm -hmm. That being the nominated. Um, anyway, they they knew that there was going to be big trouble. They started plotting their course. Um, July th or June 30th, Frick locks everybody out. Next day, they call a strike. You get locked out. We're going to strike. Um, Frick had built a, a, a uh, 11 to 12 foot fence around the mill, uh, set it up so that it was basically riot proof. And uh, so there was a need to see what was going on, hence this building. If you look back, in this corner right there, that's where, that's where they met. Because you can bear them up on the roof, because you can look down into the mill and see what was going on. But anyway, the Battle of Homestead, you know, is July 6th. Um, Henry Clay Frick is, he wants to be able to bring scab workers in, or black sheep, as they were called at the time. So he hired Pink, the Pinkerton Agency and had them send 300 men in. The sentiment, they couldn't bring him in by the road, they couldn't bring him in by rail, they would have never gotten through the town. Mm -hmm. Run him by the river, run him on barge. Mm -hmm. yeah. Battle erupts in the morning of uh, July 6th. You know, at the end of the day, there are 10 dead. Uh, seven workers, three Pinkerton. Well, this is the shortest version I've ever told of this story. Um, <laughs> usually it's like an hour and a half long. Um, Three, you know, there's, there's seven workers, three Pinkertons, a number of people injured. Eventually the Pinkertons surrender. They have no choice. They're stuck there. They're, they're, they're tug, their tugboat's gone. They took some of the injured away. So it's two barges and people just stuck there. They surrender, and as they're bring, being led off of the barges, they're attacked by the angry mob that is assembled there. Okay? Thousands and thousands of people, men, women, children. Okay? Um, eventually they're led out of town. Um, the, the workers think, yeah, we won, but it was very short-lived. Because within 10 days, um, the Pennsylvania State Militia comes to town, essentially seals off the town. It's not quite martial law, but pretty darn close. And eventually the mill starts up again. Uh, slowly people start coming in because they have no choice. There's no income. There's no net for them. There's no security for them. They slowly start coming back. By November, the strike's broken. 
Okay. And the, you know, the real lesson in here, other than this was a turning point where you know the workers would have had a say in what happens in their lives. Um, what ends up happening is there's ostensibly no union in, in the steel industry until the Wagner Act it is, well that's 1935 until it's tested in 37. Okay. So that's 40 years of no union. So conditions that were harsh to begin with became that much worse. You're looking at the 12 hour day, six days a week, seven days where you're working 24 so you can get back on the other shift. Um, if you're lucky you get a you know, day and a half off a year. You know, um, you're working for very little money with no protection. And, um, essentially, if you're my age and you're working in the steel mill, you know, post 1892, you're an old man. You're lucky to be alive. Okay. So that was the Cliff Notes version. <laughs> right. So yeah, this is our building. Uh, it's a little stretched out. Um, it was in pretty bad shape. As you can see, the top image is there. Um, it was built as a hotel, restaurant, and bar. And that's what it was for a long time. It was also a Borgello. Uh, Homestead wasn't famous just for steel. Um, it was famous for vice. But what ended up happening is what happened to a lot of buildings throughout the Rust Belt. It's not just Pittsburgh problem, it's all over. It is that as the mill went down, you know, like 70s into the mid 80s, as the mill goes down, when people abandon the town and, and move away, these buildings fall into disrepair. So its last tenant was uh, an original hot dog shop, um, which just great Pittsburgh thing. Um, my brother Barry, quite well, his best friend in high school, his family owned it, the hot dog shop. Yeah. Don't figure that's what I ended up working. Um, but anyway, it was it was about to go to sheriff sale. We've been torn down, but luckily, a gentleman named Randy Harris. Um, recognized the building for what it was and understood that this isn't just any old building. This, this is a, a historic landmark. It, it means something. It means something not just architecturally, because, you know, it's a number of buildings that look like this. It means something because of its story and it must be saved. So that began the efforts to save it. Um, this, is, this is what it looks like now. I mean, you know, four million dollars later, you know. Um, at this point, uh, close to 20 years and $4 million later, it's, it's come a long way. Um, but we came very, very close to losing it. It's now a National Historic Landmark. It's our offices. It's where the archives are. It's where the museum is. What's the middle room there? Uh, this one? Yeah. Uh, that's a room that, boy, it hasn't looked like that since I took that photo before we moved in. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's the exhibit space. Uh, what's our relation? Um, as far as uh, we play well together, uh, we work to, we work together a lot. We do tours with them. Uh, we consult with each other. So. Now, that's one one thing that's interesting about this region, and it wasn't always this way as far as the historical entities go. When I first started, there was a whole lot of. Uh, backbiting and, and jealousy and, and organizations not playing well together. That has changed. Uh, and it's a good thing. It helps all of us to where you know the History Center and University of Pittsburgh and Carnegie Mellon and History Landmarks and ourselves, we actually all get along very well and do a lot of projects together. But, so within this building is our archives. Um, where we collect not necessarily the records of U.S. Steel, though you know, we do have some, but really it's the story of the people that worked in the industry and populated the region. Okay? We don't get, at least very rarely do we get, you know, a uh, institution calling us and saying, we want to turn over all our records to you. Now, if that happens, would I say no? Of course not. <laughs> you know? But really what we get is folks like you know, they come in and, and bring, you know, their shape book, or they bring their father's um, union dues pins, or bits and pieces of their lives. So in some ways it means far more than getting a box, you know, a number of boxes of institutional records. Because what, what we do get are those little bits and pieces of, of people's lives that they hung on to, that meant so much to them. 
How many lunchboxes do you have? <laughs> <laughs> a few dozen. Um, but you know what? Each one is different um, in its own way, and each one is special because of the stories that come with it. The very first one I got it was from a gentleman named Walt, uh, Leonard Fleming. Leonard just passed away about three weeks ago. He was um, the last foreman at the 48-inch mill in Homestead. Wonderful guy. One of my first days on the job, he shows up, sweet as can be, and he brings me this lunch pail. And along with it, tells me the story about taking this into the mill with him when he started in 1932. Okay? And he's kept it all these years, and it's just fabulous, just an amazing thing. And that's what's worth it. I mean, you can find these lunch boxes. Can't find that story. I mean, we have some that came to us from, you know, I used to take this down to my grandfather. He'd throw a rope over the wall, tie the lunchbox on, him, pull the rope up, and take the lunchbox over the wall. You know, you're not going to get that when you buy it off of eBay. Just some miscellaneous items that are in there. Actually, this lower left hand corner photo, that's the board. That's what's now. Uh, it might be kind of hard to see, but that's what's now on the waterfront. Mm -hmm. Between the now. That's actually right off of the High Level Bridge. Some of the exhibits. All right. This is our current exhibit. This is seen in Pittsburgh. Right here, I have a copy of the book here. I just want to pass around and take a look at this. Mm -hmm. It's fine. Mm -hmm. um, this, was, this came about really because of conversations about what's a Pittsburgh. So what does being a Pittsburgher mean? Uh, it's a conversation that we have a lot in our office. My uh, curator of collections, uh, my right hand in most everything we do, uh, Tiffany Emmett. Tiffany did not grow up in Pittsburgh. She is from <coughs> Ohio. Um, but she came here seven years ago to go to school and absolutely fell in love with, with the region. And bought a house here and plans on staying here the rest of her life. You know, my excuse is I was born here. You know, th this is this is something that's ingrained in me. And, and as we would go through the communities in, in, in Southwest Pennsylvania, I noticed that we had two different approaches to how we saw things. And, and um, so that made us just curious: is this normal, or is it just us? You know, are we just big geeks, or is this something that happens everywhere? So we decided to take a look at communities in Pittsburgh, or surrounding Pittsburgh, because not a couple of them are outside of the city. We couldn't do every single neighborhood, but what we did is we chose 11 representative neighborhoods. Okay, that, that are either um, you know, kind of a blue-collar neighborhood, traditional blue-collar neighborhood, or a suburb, um, or a white-collar neighborhood, etc. You know, or middle town. And asked people within those communities to show us what their community needs. What I didn't want to do was me walk in and say, this is what's important. Okay? Or this is what's important. We do far too much of that. What really matters is what's important to you folks. I mean, you, you have a very good sense of what's important in Squirrel Hill. Okay? And yes, I was born here and I grew up in Squirrel Hill, so I think I share some of it, but nobody knows it better than you do. So what we wanted was folks that live in these communities, Squirrel Hill was one of them, um, to take a camera. It didn't matter whether they had any skill as a photographer or not, but take a camera and take photos of what Squirrel Hill means to Good, bad, you know, beautiful, ugly, you know, whatever it was, and, and bring them back to us and we would you know, pull things together and, and show the rest of the region and the world, what it means to be in Squirrel Hill. We also followed up with interviews with everyone. And we also asked each photographer to write a bit about their photographs. Okay. So we ended up with 44 photographers from 11 different neighborhoods. And that's what went into the book and into the exhibit. These are some of the Squirrel Hill photos. Now, we, we got hundreds of photos. Absolutely, hundreds of photos, it's really hard to choose. Yeah. You might, you probably can't see it, but the, this is your trail, that's, that's, uh, that's mm -hmm. right. Um, but, uh, you know, 
each one said something really unique about the area. And everybody had a different view. So you have a couple of natives and a couple of transplants. Um, look, I'm not going to lie. I, as soon as the picture of the uh, slide at Frick Park came in, I said, that's it. Because <laughs> I spent a good part of my childhood, I lived on Phillips, you know, so we spent a lot of time going up to Frick Park. And, and I, I wore out lots of wax paper on this puppy. And, and my, you know, we moved back in the first place I took my kids. Well, no, second place. First place we went was Minions. Second place <laughs> was, was to the park to play on the slide. Okay, so I knew. I was just, actually, I was just hoping somebody would show up for this photo. But here, I'll, I'll play a little bit of an interview done by, the, incidentally, the photographers range from, the youngest was seven, and the oldest uh, was 70 something. She wouldn't tell me exactly. What's the top right? The top right is Colfax School. And I apologize if this doesn't do it justice. If you, if you look in the book or you come to the exhibit, you can really see it. And what I loved about this, and again, there's a special attachment to me. I'm a Colfax kid. Okay. As our, you know, God knows how many other folks in here. But if you can see the faces in this image, and I apologize if it, it, it's small here, it, it, the <coughs> diversity is phenomenal. It's phenomenal. It's the same thing that when you walk down Forbes or Murray, and you see all the different phases, you know, black, white, you know, Asian, no matter, you know, it's all across the spectrum. And it's one of those things that's very unique about school. And this little girl, you know, Madeline's what, she's in sixth grade this year. She's in fifth grade when she took this. She caught it. She caught it. She took a photo of the kids leaving school and the parents picking them up, and you see that diversity. So anyway, we follow up on an interview with her. Let me see if I can get some more. Ah. there until the, the 31st and look if I, if I'm running long give me the uh, sign. I'll just keep talking um, it's there until the 31st of January and then the plan is to have it travel to different neighborhoods um, there's a gallery in town that's interested in some of it Mount and High School called us um, Monday and said they'd like to have part of it um, we're talking to some folks in Mount Washington who are interested so that's the idea was to not have it end when it, an exhibit goes up in our building and a book comes out, but for people to keep gathering these stories and these photos <coughs> and just keep it moving and starting that dialogue so people understand each other a little better. Another one of our, our projects is, is History to Go. Um, we've gotten funding to do a couple more of these, and so I'll be busy over the next few years. And what this is is a DVD-based walking tour um, that tells the story of the Battle of Homestead, so you can get the full, you know, hour-long version there. Um, it's two DVDs. It tells the story of the Battle of Homestead, but it also allows you to walk through the town of Homestead, through the community, and also through the mill site. And there's the map of where the walking tours go. It goes, it's DVD-based. You get a little portable DVD player that's, you know, about yay big. They're, they're small, they're lightweight. Really good resolution on the screen, so when you're outside in the sun, you can see it. You can still hear it. It's, it's, it's wonderful. Um, 
but you do a loop up in the community, and if you've ever driven down 10th Avenue in Homestead, or even been near it, you know how many different churches there are. Okay. And, and so this looks at the, the social life in the, in the community and the cultural life. Yeah, like. Then it also doesn't loop through the waterfront. You can walk it, you can drive it, whatever. Um, we started this originally as, a, as something based on a PDA, a little portable device you walk around with, and the technology just wasn't there yet, and it was really cumbersome. We switched over to DVDs, and we got something out of this that I never expected, which was most of our sales are actually outside of the region. It's displaced Pittsburghers. <laughs> um, you know, they're, they're ordering it, and they're, you got it. It's a, a great Pittsburgh diaspora. Um, so the nice thing about this is you can do this walking tour, you can do it on site. The main reason was to get people moving through the community and get them on the site of these things. Um, that's what it plays on. There's actually a clip that will skip that. Um, but the, the, the main purpose was to move people through the community and get them out there. Um, but what we found is it works really well if you just want to sit and watch it on your DVD player too. Um, here, I'll play a short clip. This is in front of uh, St. Michael's Church, which is technically in one hall, but it's right across the border from Homestead. <laughs> this might be a little crazy to see what about. It's the, the DVD is divided into chapters, and each chapter gives you a little segment, so it starts with this, and here we are. Calvinist Hungarians and Slovaks dedicated the first Hungarian Reformed Church of Homestead on June 12, 1904. The yellow brick church is modeled after a church in Calvin Square, Budapest. It features stained glass windows portraying religious and old world scenes and a stainless steel spire. Oh, the gypsies in Homestead. Oh, I have to tell you about their violins. You know, when they would have a funeral, they would have a procession march across 8th Avenue and about 50 violinists would play this sad, I guess it's Hungarian music. So beautiful. I, I just love Hungarian music. And it was so impressive. Can you just imagine having all those men with their violins marching, you know, with the casket ahead. Um, unfortunately, actually, Frances Bush passed away last month. Um, she was a great interview. Uh, if any of you remember Cotillia's Furniture and Homestead, mm -hmm. that was her family. Um, really good interview. But within these, this DVD are, as you saw, oral history interviews. There's archival footage. There's archival photos. Um, so you really you get a lot out of it. Um, a little section down on the waterfront. We'll play this bit just because. Gosh, aren't you expecting the industrial bit? Yeah. It works. Ah. Again, yeah, giving you wave grinding so you know where you are. This is down by uh, uh, David Rusters. Open Hearth 5. Open Hearth 5 was one of the Homestead Works' most impressive additions during the World War II expansion. The facility housed 11 225-ton Open Hearth furnaces within 600,000 square feet and rose almost 120 feet in height. The Open Hearth furnace refines blast furnace iron by the chemical reaction oxidation reduction. A charging machine loads the furnace with limestone, iron ore, and scrap metal. The scrap comes from old automobiles, machinery, railroad cars, steel rails, and other pieces of iron and steel that have outlived their usefulness. The Lego adds molten iron from the blast furnace after the mixture of limestone, iron ore, and scrap has been heated for about two hours. The temperature of the mixture must be kept at nearly 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit to 
bring about the chemical process of oxidation reduction that results in steel. So you get a sense of what's okay. All right. Let me jump. Do I need to wrap it up? Oh, okay. Let me jump. All right. So a couple other things that we're doing are podcasts and cell phone tours. There's pamphlets out there for the cell phone tours. It's uh, called Tour Anytime. Um, pretty neat. You can be at a site. In this case, the pump house. There's there, but they're all over the region. You call an access number and you get the historical data. Yeah. Yeah. What was the podcast you used? Did you say that again? Podcast? Podcasts? Yeah. What are yeah. podcasts? Or is that related to steel making or what? Well, I'll play one for it. Okay, it's something you can download <laughs> off of our website. It's okay. not a cast, yes. No, it's a, it's a what's called a podcast. It's a broadcasting on an iPod. How's that? Okay. All right. And then let's see if you can do it. This actually is a great story. So. See if you had a sense of humor. See if you could take a joke. Um, I always remember my first test, and uh, it, it was it was a good one. It'd be good today. Uh, they came out with a funnel. You know, this is after you're there a few days and they're getting to know you. They came out with a funnel, and one guy stuck it down in his belt, and he put a nickel on his head. And he and he stood there with a nickel, and he drops his head, tries to put the nickel uh, into the uh, into the funnel. And, uh, you know, some are different guys trying it. There's like a little black banner. Well, you try it, kid. You know, you know, why don't you see if you can do that? So they stick the funnel in there in your belt, and you've got the nickel back on your head. Unbeknownst to you, there's a guy with a, you know, a quarter of, or more of water hiding in the background. So as soon as you go back, they go whoosh, with the water in, into the funnel, and you're like totally soaked. And the test is there. How are you going to react? You know? And so I reacted in a good way. And, uh, and that was an accepting thing, you know. <laughs> Very typical story, by the way. Okay, well, let me, let me hop through the last couple of things. I mean, I'm going to hold you guys here on All right. So our big fish out there is, is, is establishing a national historic site or national park site in Homestead and Franken, Swiss Bay. At the old Cary Farm sites. Basically, what you're seeing right here is carry furnaces, which are the last two extant pre World War II blast furnaces in the region. Okay. And it's at these furnaces that the technology was developed and perfected that gave rise to you know, the dominance of steel in the 20th century. Okay. So they're there. The, the pump house site, which we talked about earlier briefly, in the waterfront, and then the hot metal bridge, which is off. To the side. Okay. This is the Battle of Homestead site. Well, I have to go real quick over here. That's where that battle took place. It also was a working pump house for over a hundred years, basically pulling water from the river, pushing it through the mill, and pushing it right back out into the river without cleaning it. Okay. Now you know why our rivers were dead. Uh, we, we actually use the site quite a bit. There are a number of uh, lectures down there. We have exhibits down there. Uh, we have movies. Number of things. And it's really a great site. Not this time of year, it's a little cold, but <laughs> that's the time. The Hot Metal Bridge, not the Hot Metal Bridge on the south side, but this is Rankin Hot Metal Bridge number 35, which is um, the connector between the Cary Furnace site in Rankin and the Homestead Works. We would produce iron on the Rankin side at the Cary Furnaces and bring it across in a molten state to Homestead to charge into the open air facilities. This bridge was, was built in 1899. Okay. Uh, it was donated to us uh, about eight years ago by the Union Railroad. Uh, the most over-engineered bridge in the world. Everything else is going to fall down that bridge is still going to be there. One side of it, it has uh, two-inch thick steel plating on the deck and on the sides. And that was in case it was a spill. And they're bringing molten iron across it in torpedo cars. Other ladle cars, if any of it spilled out, you don't want that hitting the water. They would say that the big explosive force. What kind of force are we talking about? Well, if a, a, a 
torpedo car of 250 tons worth oh. of molten iron, let's say, um, at eh, about 2,800 degrees, hits the water. What's going to happen? You can put water on steel, on molten iron and steel, but you can't put it on water. Okay? Because mm -hmm. what happens is it, 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 the, it traps the steam and. Okay? So if a torpedo car would spill, and that much would go into the river, that bridge would be gone and everything else around it would be gone. Okay? Yeah. Catastrophic. Is that a theory of you? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. That's uh, actually an old underwood stereo view. And it's, it's made, we have dozens of them from Homestead. And well, from throughout the district, because there was that great fascination with, with you know, everything industrial and this modern age, and they photographed all of it. They're, they're truly amazing. Yes? Uh, about 50 years ago, I was a speech therapist in traveling in one of my places to go was Homestead. It was a far different place then. It was all bustling mm -hmm. and all the mills were there and all the kids were the children of workers and they were very mixed, mm -hmm. black and white, and they were all very good friends. There was no distinction at all. One of uh, my second graders who had an R quadrum which she managed to fix, he was the most adorable little boy, named George D. Bolt. <laughs> <laughs> I laugh because I know him well. <laughs> yeah, he grew up in Georgia. Big deal in Homestead. Yeah. Yeah, George is a character. He's still chugging along, too. Now, his family relates right back to the, the strike. <laughs> if, if you know anything about George. And that uh, they were, <coughs> his grandfather was a seal worker who was blacklisted. And uh, so he had to do something. Because he couldn't work in the in the mill anymore, he started a trucking company, the moving company, which grew into the bolt trucking, and then they eventually bought buses and took over part of the Bamford line. And uh, so. that last photo, what was in the bottom left of the photo before this? The bottom left hand corner. Before this one? Yeah, that one right there. For this? Mm -hmm. That's a stereo view of the hot metal bridge. Oh, that's right. showing, okay. you know, unlike the hot metal bridge on the south side where it's two separate bridges, and it's very distinct, and actually the part that you've been driving across the past however many years that they called the, the hot metal bridge yeah. wasn't the hot metal bridge. That was the railroad bridge. Yeah, exactly. That was the commodity side. Yeah. Well, the, the side that is now the bicycle trail was the hot metal side. Uh, this one is one single deck that is divided. It, it was built specifically for this. It's actually a okay, Pennsylvania Trust and a Baltimore Trust together. Um, but the one side that you can see, that's that's the side that has a plan on it. The other side's an open side. Now the plan for this bridge is to use it as a, again as a connector between the sites. And um, the Allegheny County, and I'll jump right into this carry stuff. I'm coming way over. This is the big fish. I'll, I'll get back to the bridge in a second. This is the big fish. The carry car site. Um, it is our goal to have it preserved as a well, national park or a national historic site. For the consumer, very little difference. Um, it's just all about how it's administered and how the money comes from the national park. But the point being is that this site, these blast furnaces, which are truly phenomenal. If any of you have gone on a tour over there? Yes, sir. Okay. All right. So if you've been there, you know. Awe inspired. Truly amazing. Um, you get a real sense of the, the scale of the mill and what happened. But it's not just going to be the story of Homestead or Rankin, but it's really it's the story of the region and this country. And, and what happened here helped build this country and helped change the world. So it's really be the vehicle for it. Right? So the story is. Right now, it's owned by Allegheny County. Um, when the mill closed down, U.S. Steel sold the Homestead Works, which is 420 acres, both sides of the river, to the Park Corporation based out of Cleveland. Um, they scrapped out a whole bunch of it, tore down a number of the furnaces, etc. Uh, we negotiated with them for years trying to get this site. Uh, didn't go well. 
But they didn't tear it down, so I'll give them that. Uh, but what we were able to do a few years ago was get the county to come in and purchase the site and really act as an intermediary. So we're in the process of negotiating with the county on a lease for the site to start <coughs> preserving it. They bought 107 acres, give or take an acre. I think it's 107, <coughs> which they want to redevelop. They're not going to do another waterfront. We can't, we can't have another waterfront. What they want is um, more recreation-based and more residential based, rather than retail. Now they have so much retail. But in amongst that is 38 acres, which we want. And that's preserved as the National Historic Site. The county is very interested in the Hot Metal Bridge. If you've ever <clears throat> tried to get down into the Cary site, you know how difficult it is. Uh, there's only one way in and out that's across a double set of railroad tracks. But there's a great way in and out if you have the Hot Metal Bridge. So at this point, um, the way it's probably going to all shake out is that uh, we will trade them the Hot Metal Bridge for a couple of furnaces. <laughs> so, with the plan to restore the furnaces, I mean, they're not going to be pristine. Actually, how much time do I have? Do I have like a minute to show something? Okay. Ooh, yeah. yeah so, so. Um, now, if I can find it, there it is. All right. Now, this is a little too Disney for my liking. I hope it plays. There we go. All right. But this is our architect who does a lot of the master planning for these things. This is his. Is a wonderful 3D computer graphic of the site mm -hmm. in the future. Okay. Wow. Is it, it's never going to be this clean. <laughs> right? um, I don't think we'll have the little red, white, and blue bands up on the top either. But it gives you a sense of what can be done. Okay. The site restored so that people can then, there'll be catwalks so you can move around the site and understand not just the iron making process but also the significance of it. Um, you know, whether there'll be you know, these like monorails that run around or not, I don't know, but it's a good pitch. But it's a little frisky. Yeah, so I'm going to go. But you get a sense that it, and there'll be a marina and hopefully a hotel. And be, what it does is it really serves as a first day attraction for this region. It pulls people in from all over, not just the country. Okay. Well, you guys want to come visit, I'll show you this bill. All right. So anyway, the, we do carry first tours. We didn't have them this past year because we're a little squabble in the county. But we're all making nice now. And it looks like we'll have the tours this year. We have my typo, it should say tour dates. But give us a call, check in, go to the website, and we should be announcing dates shortly. Okay.